Hi everyone. Our today's lesson is about Jane Eyre by Charlotte Bronte. And uh, this lesson is for my master's students. So that's why our uh, PPT is too long. Sorry for that because Jane Eyre is really um, interesting and necessary. Uh, one of the main uh, necessary novels in English literature. And uh, so we have three contents here as you see uh, according to our syllabi so the first one is the middle of the century early victorianism in 19th english literature social classes and baby boom of course we will talk about baby boom and social classes widely in charles dickens period because uh, in his novels we can see the effect of baby boom so much uh, more than charlotte Bronte's novels uh, but here we will uh, discuss about the social classes, the differences between them and uh, Charlotte Bronte as a main female writer of this period. So uh, we will talk about her uh, novels and the main novel, Jane Eyre. The major themes in Jane Eyre and typological comparison of Jane Eyre with other novels and characters. It's also the interesting point of our lesson. Hermeneutic analysis of the text of Jane Eyre, and you know that it's uh, also another part of our uh, lesson that we have to analyze um, uh, symbols and themes and, uh, according to the hermeneutic, uh, hermeneutical uh, theories. So uh, let's get started. The traits of Victorian English society. Here we have um, four headings. The first one is England as a leading industrial society. You know that this period was playing the main role for English uh, industry, English economy. Uh, the Victorian age beginning in uh, 1837 and lasting until 1901 was a period of massive changes uh, for England, both uh, socially and economically. The period was generally a time of peace and prosperity and by the uh, 1840s England had emerged as the leading industrial society of the world uh, uh, and the hub uh, of a West colonial empire. But uh, also, the rising middle class was amazing uh, unprecedented wealth, but for the working population, the 1840s came to be known as the hungry 40s, a time of poverty and economic uh, upheaval. While the sense of national pride uh, at their country's exalted position on the world stage may have been uh, gratifying to the British people. What mattered most to them was the quality of their lives at home. The process of social development and political reform, which had begun earlier in the century, continued throughout the Victorian period too. And a middle class women, it's also another issue of this period, there was also the question of the growing number of poor, unmarried women who had limited means of supporting themselves and who were beginning to pose a real problem to society. And uh, one of the few options for the unmarried uh, surplus woman who needed to support uh, themselves uh, was to become a governess. A governess was one of those people without position uh, in society uh, because she did not belong uh, to the household or the servant. It was a bitter uh, experience shared by many women, including Charlotte Bronte herself. The occupation of governess has special appeal for middle-class women during the Victorian era. At this period, a woman who was not financially supported by a husband or other male relative had few days to earn a living. While um, many women uh, in this period did work in um, mills and uh, factories, the unmarried uh, daughters of merchants, doctors, lawyers and clergymen uh, sought more suitable employment that could offer a moderately respectable lifestyle. A governess lived uh, with the upper middle class or upper class family uh, who hired her 
to teach their children. Um, in addition to securing comfortable lodgings, uh, she earned a modest salary. And uh, the fourth one is about the woman who was the angel in the house for Victorian ideal. So according to uh, the Victorian ideal, a uh, woman was the angel in the house and she was expected to be submissive and not, uh, not um, uh, uh, so not do dominated but submissive, chaste and physically frail in addition to being religious, self-denying and capable of tremendous feats of self-discipline. Armed with these contradicting characteristics, the Victorian women were seen to represent morality and strength against harsh and a competitive world of business in which men could not afford to possess. So, uh, the literal background of Victorian era. We talked about the economic, economical and social background of Victorian era and now we have to start to literal background. So, uh, the first heading is Victorianism and the novel. As you know, as the Renaissance is identified with drama and Romanticism with poetry, uh, but the Victorian age with a the novel. There are several reasons for the triumph of fiction, but perhaps the most significant is the rapid growth in the middle classes who, since the 18th century, had been avid consumers of this form of literature. Other factors, such as an improved education system, which uh, led to greater literacy and a fall in book prices, due to improved printing techniques and chapter um, uh, transport costs also contributed uh, to success of the novel and it was also so cheap and uh, circulating libraries became very popular and allowed people to borrow books for a relatively modest sum a woman who had been Freed uh, from traditional course uh, such as candle and uh, bread making, uh, had more time to dedicate to reading and became avid consumers of fiction. Indeed, uh, the Victorian age is characterized by the emergence of women, not just readers, but also as influential writers. So, there are some main representatives of Victorianism in English literature. Um, we are talking about uh, if we are talking about Victorian era, we should of course uh, firstly think about Charles Dickens. He is the main figure of this uh, period, and also William Thackeray, uh, then Bronte sisters, Thomas Hardy or George Bernard Shaw, Oscar Wilde, and uh, other writers. But they are main figures of this period. But today we will talk about just Charlotte Bronte. Uh, she was an English novelist and poet, uh, used the name Carver Bell and uh, worked as a teacher and governess, dealt with a lot of literary rejections. So, Charlotte Bronte was an English novelist and poet, uh, as you know, the eldest of the three Bronte sisters who survived into adulthood and whose novels became classics of English literature. And why did they use uh, the name Bell? Uh, it's the uh, masculine name, not female name. Uh, Bell was the middle uh, name of Howard's uh, curate, Arthur Bell Nichols, whom Charlotte later married. And Currer was the surname of Francis Mary Richardson Currer, who had founded their school and maybe their father. Uh, but the main question, why they use it? Uh, because she did not like to declare herself a woman because without at that time suspecting that her mode of writing and thinking was not was uh, what is called a feminine. She had a vague impression that author, authors uh, are liable to be looked um, on with prejudice. She had noticed how critics sometimes use for their uh, testaments uh, the weapon of personality and for her reward uh, flattery, which is not true praise. So, um, uh, worked as a teacher and governess. Uh, in her late 
teens and early 20s, uh, like Jane Eyre, Bronte worked on and off as a teacher and governess. In between writing, she taught uh, at a schoolhouse but didn't like the long hours. She also didn't love working as a governess in a family home. She realized uh, she wasn't a good fit for these uh, caretaking jobs. But she later used her early work experience as inspiration for passages in Jane Eyre. Then, uh, dealt with a lot of uh, literary rejections. When she was 20 years old, Bronte sent uh, the English poet laureate Robert Sousey some of her best poems. Uh, but Sousey wrote back in uh, 1837, telling her that <clears throat> she obviously had a good deal of talent and a gift with words, but that she should give up writing. He said that literature cannot be the business of a woman's life, and it ought not to be. Uh, the more uh, she is engaged in her proper duties, the less leisure will she have for it, even as an accomplishment and a recreation. So... And the professor, the novel professor, uh, Bronte's first novel, was rejected nine times before it was finally published after her death. So, her novels here we wrote um, Jane Eyre, Shirley, Willett, The Professor, and Emma. So, Jane Eyre published in 1847 and Shirley published in 1849. But uh, pay attention to uh, the Professor. It was written before Jane Eyre, was first submitted together with Wuthering Heights by Emily Bronte, uh, um, Charlotte Bronte's sister, and Agnes Grey by Anna Bronte. Subsequently, the Professor was resubmitted separately and rejected by many publishing houses. It was published in uh, 1857 that's why and Emma is a title of manuscript by Charlotte Bronte uh, left incomplete when she died in uh, 1855 it was uh, completed by Claire Boylan and published as Emma Brown in 2003 Bronte uh, began uh, work on Emma in um, 1853 her marriage in 1854 and the uh, lukewarm enthusiasm of her husband for the project may have contributed to her slow progress towards completion the manuscript was left unfinished at her death in 1855 so the original 20 page manuscript consists of two chapters describing the arrival of an apparently wealthy young girl, uh, Matilda Fitzgibbon, and um, at an ex expensive private school, it uh, transpires that uh, her identity is fake and that her uh, school fees will not be paid. The child is unable to answer any questions as to her true uh, identity. So then, um, as I said before, um, Claire Boylan uh, took these two uh, chapters, uh, uncompleted to any pages, and uh, he, she tried to, um, to continue to write about Emma's life. And it was so lucky, I would say. Then let's uh, talk about Jane Eyre. Uh, it was written in <clears throat> 1847, as I said before. <clears throat> it written as a first-person narrative, five specific stages of Jane's growth, so her childhood, Lewood, Thorn Thornfield, and Marsh End, and Return to Thornfield, elements of the Gothic novels. Okay, so uh, written as a first-person uh, narrative. The novel um, follows the plain but intelligent Jane Eyre in her development as an individual from her traumatic childhood. So here Bronto describes five specific stages of Jane's growth over the course of the novel. First one is uh, her childhood among oppressive relatives. Second one, her time as a student at Lewitt School. Third one, her months as a governess at Thornfield, Thornfield Manor. Fourth, uh, her time with her cousins at Marsh End. And finally, her return to Thornfield Manor and marriage to Mr. Rochester. As a classic example of the Germanic uh, buildings roman or a novel of formation, the text demonstrates Jane's attempts 
to define her identity against forces of opposition in each of these five stages. So uh, Bronte also uh, employs many elements of the Gothic novel, another classic literary tool uh, from the period, in order to provide a more tragic bend to Jane's struggles. Mr. Rochester's uh, characterization as a stereotypical Byronic hero, the uh, ominously gothic nature of uh, Thornfield Manor, Jane's uh, unrequited love for Mr. Rochester and the concept of the mad woman in the attic, each of these aspects of the novel relate directly to understandings of the gothic tradition. But uh, also we have uh, another slide about the major themes. You know that in every video lesson we are discussing the themes of the novel. Here we have, I, I just chose five main themes uh, for you. The first one is religious contrast. The second one, seeking out family. The contrast between social classes. The use of Gothic elements. An ugly appearance and a kind soul. It's a binary opposition. So let's start with the first theme. Religion. Uh, so Jane receives uh, three different models of Christianity throughout the novel, all of which she rejects uh, either partly or completely uh, before finding her own way. Mr. Uh, Brocklehurst's um, is full of hypocrisy. He spouts off uh, on the benefits of uh, privation and humility while he indulges in a life of luxury and emotionally abuses the students at Lewood. Also at Lewood, Helen Burns' uh, Christianity of uh, absolute forgiveness and tolerance is too meek for Jane's tastes. Helen constantly uh, suffers her punishments silently and eventually dies. St. John's uh, religion, uh, religious principle uh, was to the exaltion of any passion. So Jane rejects his marriage proposal as much for his detached brand uh, of spirituality as for its certain instruction on the independence. So, however, Jane uh, frequently looks to God in her own way throughout the book particularly after she learns of Mr. Rochester's previous marriage and before St. Joan takes her into Moore House. She also learns to adapt Helen's uh, doctrine of forgiveness without becoming complete passive and returns to Mr. Rochester when she feels that she is ready to accept him again. And another theme here is about the family. Um, Sorry for pausing. Um, so we were talking about the major themes of Jane Eyre. And the second one is about the family theme. So the main quest in Jane Eyre is Jane's search for family. Uh, she was seeking out her family for a sense of belonging and love. However, this search is constantly tempered by Jane's need for independence. She begins uh, the novel as an unloved orphan who is almost obsessed with uh, finding love as a way to establish her own identity and achieve happiness. Although she doesn't receive any parental love uh, from Mrs. Reed, um, her uncle's wife, Jane finds uh, surrogate maternal figures throughout the rest of the novel. Bessie, uh, Miss Temple and even uh, Mrs. Uh, Fairfax uh, care for Jane and give her the love and guidance that she needs. And she returns the favor by caring for Adel and the students at her school. Still, uh, Jane doesn't feel as uh, though she has found her true family until she falls in love with Mr. Rochester at Thornfield. However, uh, she is unable to accept uh, Mr. Rochester's first marriage proposal because she realizes that their marriage 
one based uh, on unequal social standing would uh, compromise her autonomy. Uh, Jane similarly denies uh, St. John's marriage proposal too, as it would be on uh, one of uh, duty, not of passion. Only when she gains a financial and emotional autonomy after having received her inheritance and uh, the familial love uh, of her cousins can Jane accept uh, Rochester's offer. In fact, uh, the blinded uh, Rochester is more dependent on her, at least until he regains uh, his sight. Within uh, her marriage to Rochester, uh, Jane finally feels completely liberated, bringing her dual uh, quests for family and independence to a satisfying conclusion. And the other uh, uh, theme is about the social... Um, sorry is about the social contrast so the difference between social classes social positions bronte uses uh, the novel to express her uh, critic of victorian class differences jane is consistently a poor individual within a wealthy environment particularly with the reeds and at thornfield there is a character that makes very bad uh, social difference uh, with uh, Jane Eyre, uh, she is Miss Ingram. Her beauty and higher social standing makes her Jane's main competitor for Miss Rochester's love. However, Jane is um, superior in uh, terms of intellect and uh, character. Moreover, Jane's refusal to marry Mr. Rochester because of their difference in social stations demonstrates her uh, morality and belief in the importance of personal independence. So, uh, the other um, problem is, uh, is the gender problem. And, um, and also, uh, we have to talk about the Gothic elements, uh, but I didn't write here the gender problem. Um, I will explain you anyway. Uh, the use of Gothic elements here uh, is also another theme. Um, uh, Bronte uses many elements of uh, the Gothic literary tradition uh, to create a sense of suspense and drama in the novel. Uh, his fir first of all, uh, uh, she employs Gothic techniques in order to set the stage for the narrative. The majority of the events in the novel uh, take place within a gloomy mansion, uh, Thornfield, uh, manner with sacred chambers and a mysterious demonic love uh, belonging to the mad woman in the attic. Bronto uh, also evokes a sense of the supernatural incorporating the terrifying ghost of uh, Mr. Reed in the red room and creating a sort of um, uh, telepathic connection uh, between Jane and Mr. Rochester. And uh, of course, I would like to add here uh, gender uh, gender problems, uh, if I can. Where is okay? I would like to add here gender. Oh, sorry. Gender uh, problems. It's also the main theme in. Um, the main theme in this novel. Oh, so it's the eight. Mm -hmm. So um, the gender problem is another uh, main major theme of this novel. Uh, it, it the novel begins with Jane's imprisonment in a red room at Gateshead, and later in the book uh, Bertha's imprisonment in the attic at uh, Thornfield is revealed. The connection implies that Jane's imprisonment is symbolic of her lower social class, while Bertha's containment is symbolic of Victorian marriage. All women, if they marry under unequal circumstances as Bertha did, um, will eventually be confined and oppressed by their husbands in uh, some manner. Significantly, Jane is uh, consciously aware of the problems as associated with unequal uh, marriages. 
Thus, even though she loves Mr. Rochester, she refuses to marry him until she has her own fortune and can uh, enter into the marriage contract as his equal. And... Um, and also, while it's difficult to uh, separate Jane's economic and gender obstacles, it's clear that her position as a woman also prevents her from wintering out uh, into the world as many of the male characters do. Mr. Rochester, her Uncle John and St. John uh, and so on. Indeed, um, her desire for a worldly experience makes her last name ironic, as air derives from an old French word meaning to travel. So, um, another um, theme is an ugly appearance and a kind soul. Uh, so, um, throughout the novel, Bronte plays uh, with a uh, dichotomy between external beauty and internal beauty. Both Bertha Masson and um, Ingram, Mrs. Ingram, are described as stunningly beautiful, but in each case, the external beauty obscures an internal ugliness. Only Jane, who uh, lacks uh, the external beauty of typical Victorian heroines, has the inner beauty that appeals to Mrs. Rochester. Her intelligence, her wit, um, and a cold morality expresses a far greater personal beauty than, than uh, that of uh, any other character in the novel uh, did. And Bronte clearly intends to highlight the importance of personal development and growth rather than superficial um, appearances. Once Mr. Rochester loses his hand and eyesight, uh, they are also uh, on equal footing in terms of appearance. Both uh, must look beyond superficial qualities in order to love each other. And um, hermeneutic analysis. So we talked about the two, um, uh, two main um, contents that are describing in our syllabi. So it's, uh, so the third, Topic is about the third uh, content uh, in our syllabi. It's about the analysis of three painting pictures. And so uh, I would like to know uh, that if you know about the words hermeneutics, um, it's about the um, it's um, the technique uh, that you should understand what's written on the text. If you know some uh, the meanings of the numerals, uh, colors, or uh, other specific symbols, or just the words, um, the sacred meanings of the words, uh, it means you can easily um, uh, give the statement of the uh, novels, so you can easily uh, anal analyze the text. So it's called hermeneutic analysis, uh, and here we will analyze uh, main paintings that are describing in volume uh, one and chapter thirteen. Um, it's about the Jane Eyre's paintings. Uh, we know that when we read the original text, we know that uh, when she was um, in a Louvud, uh, she uh, in her leisure time she uh, tried to draw something uh, with watercolor. And when he came to Thornfield, um, Mr. Rochester wanted uh, her to show them. And uh, we will uh, talk about these three paintings, uh, these the symbols that are describing in these three paintings, and we will just, uh, we will analyze them according to Sigmund Freud's theory, um, the subconscious mind power, the effect of hard childhood to the future life art and activities sublimate the energy in subconscious so and other uh, and also we have two other symbols the red room and thornfield burning so uh, maybe you know you are master students maybe you know about this Sigmund Freud theory um, he claimed that um, um, whatever you live during your lifetime your childhood will be like a shadow uh, over your future so, um, maybe it depends if you want to do uh, something, um, in, I mean, in art, uh, if you want to just draw the picture or compose the music or uh, maybe to, to make the statue, um, you can give something from yourself. 
So we have here three painting pictures by Jane Eyre and they have some several um, aspects, several symbols that they are describing and we can easily uh, understand that it's because of Jane Eyre's uh, bad childhood, it's the shadow of her childhood. And um, why uh, why did he uh, why did she uh, painted them? Because it was the uh, sublimation of the energy in our subconsciousness. She was in a really bad condition. She didn't uh, have family. She didn't have mother and father, and uh, they were a lot of people that didn't didn't love her. That's why uh, she um, just grown up uh, with a lack of love and uh, kindness. That's why uh, all of them affected to uh, her um, uh, consciousness. That's why uh, she drove them. She wanted to sublim sublimate this energy through the art. And um, let's look at the first painting. Uh, I would like you to pause the video right now and read this um, uh, read this um, paragraph uh, attentively, and then we will start to discuss the analysis of the paintings. So it's about the first, the description of the first uh, picture. If you read uh, this paragraph, you can imagine something in your brain. And I can just show you the example that uh, I could find from the internet and uh, attached here. So here we have this uh, painting shows uh, uh, um, the bare hand of a faintly visible drawn corpse here uh, so and a gold bracelet gold bracelet rising out of a green sea uh, this painting is an expression of Jane's uh, conscious thoughts but also of her subconscious which is represented by the drawn uh, corpse it could be symbolic of Jane's inner feelings of despair and hopelessness during her time at Lewood, but could also serve as a foreshadowing of trouble to come. So here we have uh, the meaning of colors. It's so gloomy. It's gray. It's it can't give you happiness. And also, you see, there is not any uh, boundaries of the sea. It means the helpless woman uh, around, no one can help her. And this is the s symbol of wealthiness. Uh, so he is lack of money and also lack of help and lack of love. And um, so you can also uh, analyze this picture according to your own opinions. But uh, Let's uh, skip to the second painting. So it's about the second painting again. You can find these paragraphs from the chapter 13 in volume 1. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, it's about the page number 5 or 6 in the chapter 13. So the second painting. Pause the video, please, and uh, read it attentively. Then we will skip to the picture and analysis. So I hope you understood what is written here and uh, you have some image in your brain that you can see this picture. This painting is a description of a hill with leaves and uh, grass blown the wind. So you see the wind and the dark sky uh, is also visible in the background and in the sky the partial figure of a woman. The evening star can also be seen. And the, Mr. Rochester interprets the heel um, to be um, Latmus, which is where uh, the goddess Selen fell in love with Endymion in Greek mythology. So uh, Charlotte Bronte used the mythology here with the describing these um, things in the painting too. And this could serve as a foreshadowing of Jane's relationship with Rochester and is a sign of her longing to find love herself. And the third painting, again, please pause the video and uh, then I will show you uh, the analysis. 
Am I recording? Okay. So, I hope that you read, you almost read, um, the third picture uh, is like that. Uh, this image is description of iceberg in the winter sky and there is a colossal human head uh, resting on the iceberg above the temples amidst uh, red turban folds gleamed a ring of white flame this pale crescent was the likeness of a kingly crown what it diademed was the shape which shape had none again this painting could reveal jane a uh, subconsciousness uh, thoughts of hopelessness and her cold and lonely despair this could be interpreted as a symbol of Rochester's loss of his sight later in the novel. And uh, she is bending her head to the iceberg. Maybe here iceberg symbolizes Rochester because we know that Rochester was so called by his character. And uh, but at the end they um, they were together, they came together, and uh, um, Jane Eyre say, said that I married him. So it, this picture can symbolize the end of their, um, how to say, the end of their sufferings. And uh, by Jane Eyre herself. So here uh, I would like you to read this uh, paragraph um, attentively. While he is so occupied, I will tell you, reader what they are. So, it's after Rochester asked for Jane Eyre to show uh, her paintings. Jane Eyre stopped the dialogue with Rochester and started the di dialogue, direct dialogue with uh, the reader. And she says, while he's so occupied, so while he's so occupied with my paintings, I will tell you one thing. I want to tell you something. Uh, reader, what they are and first i must premise that they are nothing wonderful she means her paintings she means that her paintings uh, are not wonderful the subjects had indeed risen vividly on my mind so from here we can see that it's uh, expression um the description of Jane's uh, subconscious. As I saw them with a spiritual eye, before I attempted to embody them, they were striking, but my hand would not second my fancy. And in each case, it had uh, wrote out but a pale portrait of the thing I had conceived. So, uh, this paragraph just shows us everything about these paintings. Analysis of symbols, as I wrote before, the two main symbols, the Red Room and also Thornfield Burning. Red Room uh, can be viewed as a symbol of what uh, Jane must overcome in her struggles to find freedom, happiness and a sense of belonging. In the Red Room, Jane's position of exile um, and imprisonment uh, first becomes clear. Although Jane is eventually uh, freed uh, from the room, she continues to be socially ostracized, financially trapped and uh, excluded from love. Her sense of independence and her freedom of self-expression are constantly threatened. And another major symbol is a uh, throne field burning. Prior to meeting Jane, Mr. Rochester is impulsive and wild. He wants to change and tries to use Jane's purity to help motivate his transformation. Even with Jane's influence, Mr. Rochester can change. It's not until Thornfield burns down and Mr. Rochester loses his hand and sight that he is able to change. Symbolically, it's as uh, if his lies and passions have finally exploded. Now, Mr. Rochester can change with the help of Jane and be the perfect husband. And let's uh, talk about genre of Jane Eyre. So, um, the genre is really complicated and controversial because we have hybrid of three genres here. The Gothic novel, the romance novel and buildings roman. 
So, uh, the Gothic novel uh, utilizes the mysterious, the supernatural, the horrific, the romantic, and romance novel emphasizes love and passion, represents the notion of lovers, destined um, for each other, and the building's Roman narrates the story of a character's internal development as he or she undergoes a succession of encounters with the external world. So that's why we can't say that it's just a gothic novel or just a romance. It's the hybrid of three genres. And narrative analysis of Jane Eyre. It's, my, it's one of my favorite uh, topics, uh, the narrative aspects. So, according to Norman Friedman, a uh, theory, uh, maybe you know, or uh, I just um, suppose that maybe you don't know the theory, that's why I just wrote here um, eight of them. Uh, according to Norman Friedman, theory, the narrative um, have uh, eight types. So, editorial omniscience, neutral omniscience, eyewitness, eye protagonist, multiple selective omniscience, selective omniscience, dramatic mode, and camera. So, which one uh, we can uh, say that um, this one is for Jane Eyre? How, how, uh, how do you think? So, uh, for that you have to know um, meanings of them, so you can search. But here we have uh, the meaning of two main narrative types, the eyewitness and the eye protagonist. The eyewitness uh, tells the story in his own words, but lacks uh, the omniscience of the authorial narrator. For example, Nick in The Great Gatsby uh, or Dr. Watson in Sherlock Holmes and so on, they are eyewitness narrators. So they are the narrators and also witness to all um, all incidents. But the eye protagonist, uh, on the other hand, is a typical narrator of autobiographical novels. He, she talks about himself or herself. So Jane Eyre is witness to all events in uh, this novel. She is also the protagonist of the novel because all events happen around her. Exceptions. We have exceptions here. So the narrate narrative aspects uh, can claim that here uh, Jane is I protagonist, but not every time, not in every chapters, because after the after she abandoned Thornfield, she didn't know what happened with Mr. Rochester and Bertha. So uh, she narrated, but she was not a witness of that incidents or accidents. She learned all these things from Mr. Rochester's butler. And after she went to Lewood, uh, she didn't know what happened with her relatives. So all of these things we learn with the help of dialects or with the help of other person. And then Jane Eyre talked about them. So in this case, Jane uh, turned to I uh, protagonist and I and narrator like a third person narrator uh, but not eyewitness because he she didn't uh, witness to these incidents and i was glad of yes here uh, you can easily Oh, sorry. You can easily see that I was glad of it. I never liked long books, especially on chilly afternoons. It's from the chapter one. Then I resisted all the way. A new thing for me. The fact is, I was a trifle beside myself. It's from chapter two. And reader, I married him. It's really a great quote, uh, quote from uh, this novel. The central character, the protagonist and the narrator. So it's the... Um, connectivity of these three items. Here from the pronouns uh, you can easily see that it's the I protagonist narrator. Then uh, comparative analysis. Let's get started to interesting part of our lesson. Uh, they have several novels, uh, several uh, stories and several characters in the world literature and also in English literature, that you can compare with Jane Eyre. The first one I would like to compare is Jane Slayer. Uh, it's um, published many uh, um, after many years, um, uh, after publishing Jane Eyre, uh, 
and it's uh, like the other side of Jane Eyre. So here, the original Jane Eyre, we see uh, so um, how to say so innocent, um, good mannered. A good character, but Jane Slayer is opposite of this novel. Let's see clearly. Uh, so here we have I've written here for you. In Jane Eyre, uh, the name is Eyre, but here it is the name is a Slayer. It's similar, almost similar. And Gateshead Hall, it's not changing. The place is the same. But uh, in Gateshead Hall, uh, Jane's uncle's house. But here, it's a shelter of family of vampires. It's quite different uh, context. And Lewood School, a charity institution for orphan girls. But in Jane Slayer, Lewood School is full of zombies. And Jane Eyre, uh, Bertha is Rochester's mad wife. I wouldn't say her mad, um, but in Jane Slayer, Bertha Rochester's lunatic werewolf wife in his attic, so almost similar. And Jane Eyre, uh, Helen is Jane's best friend, but here Helen is zombie. So it's quite different direction of the novel. If you know this novel, I would like you to explain me another sides of or similarities or differences between these two novels for our seminars. If you don't know about Jane Slayer, so let's um, research about it, and it would be I think it would be easy interesting for you. And another, it's. I would say that it's mashup of Jane Eyre. So uh, here in Jane Eyre we saw what we think that Jane Eyre is a good mannered, so good character we can see here. We think that Jane Eyre is good, but here we can see that uh, it's quite different um, part of uh, the novel. It's not the same, it's not the similar. The names, the places are the same, but the context is quite different, so fantastical. The original uh, Jane Eyre here, but it's like the parody of Jane Eyre. So, Jane Eyre is like a positive form of photo, yes, I would say exactly, and Jane Slayer is like a negative form of photo, like you, you see here. It's Mashing up. If you don't know about mash up, uh, please um, make me be aware of it. I would like to uh, explain mash up you uh, widely, not just with one slide. Just make me be aware of it. And comparative analysis too. Also, we have the second novel um, called Rebecca. Um, so it's also published after Jane Eyre and they have many similarities between them. Uh, so Jane Eyre, uh, narrative aspect uh, is like I protagonist, I was glad of it and blah blah blah. And the second one, Rebecca, narrative aspects the same. The uh, I protagonist narrative. And uh, the place where uh, the incidents are happening in Jane Eyre is Thornfield. But in Rebecca, it's Manderley, so quite different. And uh, here we know Berta, uh, that is the mad wife of Rochester, and here we know about Rebecca. And the marriage of Mrs. Rochester and Berta, here we have in Jane Eyre, and marriage of Maximilian and Rebecca in Rebecca. So the progress of Jane Eyre we saw here um, that um, from um, the beginning of her life till uh, her marriage with Rochester so it's the progress of the protagonist and here the progress of Mrs. De Winter. The effect of Rochester's marriage to his love and the final, the effect of Maxim's marriage to his love. So almost the same but almost different topics you can see in these novels, but it's really um, interesting and uh, relevant to compare. Even if you want to write an article, you can choose these two topics and you can analyze uh, Rebecca according to Jane Eyre. So, uh, the similarities in genres, so uh, Jane Eyre and Rebecca is the same, with a horror, gothic, mystery and romance, um, and comparative analysis third. 
Jane Eyre and White Sargasso Sea. I would say it's the best comparative uh, analysis for me. It's the best one because uh, I said before that I wouldn't say that ba ma ba um, Bertha is uh, mad uh, because we don't know about her l life. Uh, we don't know everything about her life. Uh, because here in Jane Eyre, Jane is the protagonist and uh, we're just focusing on her. But in Wild Sarga, so see, um, Bertha is protagonist. That's why we can easily focus on her and we can easily find out how was her life. And I would say Wild Sarga, so see, is better than Jane Eyre. Uh, so, uh, the analysis of name, uh, it would be <laughs> it would be funny for you that why the teacher attached here geographical picture, but first, if you want to um, um, anal analyze, you have to know the, uh, uh, how to say, um, the secret meanings of the words. What is Sargasso see? Do you have any idea about it? It's not just a name. Sargasso Sea uh, is a region of uh, the Bermuda Triangle, so here in Atlantic Ocean, bounded by four, four currents forming an ocean gyre. Unlike all other regions called seas, unlike all other seas, it has no land boundaries. So it's the main feature of this sea. And I would say it's the main feature of Bertha too. It's uh, no land boundaries. The sea has no any land boundaries. It can tell you something. So in White Sargasso Sea, um, uh, Antonit, who is um, symbolizing Bertha, Mm, she's also like Sargasso Sea and without any uh, mm, boundaries and also without help. You can uh, analyze uh, this novel uh, according to this feature. So, what are the differences and uh, similarities between two, uh, these two novels? The first one is narrative aspects. Uh, in why Sargasso see narrative aspect is multiple selective omniscience and uh, the similarity is that they have three parts in Sargasso see and three volumes in Jane Eyre so uh, from the beginning of the book we know about the childhood of Antonet uh, like uh, the childhood of Jane Eyre and the um, Anthony is symbolizing Bertha in Jane Eyre and in Jane Eyre the shadow of Miss Rochester's and Bertha's marriage uh, but in Wild Sargos you see clear family portrait of Miss Rochester and Anthony. He, it's here quite different um, uh, character and Bertha is a mad woman like an animal uh, reader hates her in Jane Eyre but Antoinette is like a victim of genetic illness reader feels pity for her it's the main difference between these two characters and novels and another uh, it's also my favorite one uh, comparative analysis uh, force so Jane Eyre and the Wren. Wren is in English Chalukushu so uh, I think uh, you all know about this novel it's from the Turkish literature of uh, early 20th century it was written in uh, 1922 uh, so I would say that the Wren, so this novel, Chalukushu, is, um, how to say, another portrait of Jane Eyre, which is uh, so similar to Jane Eyre. So I uh, wrote here the similarities of these two novels. The hard childhood of Jane Eyre, we know from the Jane Eyre, and the hard childhood of Feride who is the protagonist of Chalukushu. Chalukushu is her nickname. I will um, explain you the meaning uh, in the next slide. And the second one, Orphan Jane Eyre and here Orphan Feride. I protagonist narrator, I protagonist narrator. The same, exactly the same. I wouldn't say uh, that Rashad Nuri Guntekin may be uh, copied from Jane Eyre. Uh, every time you know that um, all, um, I wouldn't say all, uh, majority of writers were inspired from other writers. So it's normal in literature. I wouldn't say that it's copying and pasting. 
but it's really uh, interesting um, novel and really a uh, touchable novel uh, like Jane Eyre. Here Lubut School for Orphan Girls and here French School for Girls and also the French language here uh, in the same level. Rochester's cold character, Cameron's cold character is the same. Poor love and marriage preparation of Jane and Rochester. Poor love and marriage preparation of Farida and Cameron. Rochester's marriage with another woman, Cameron's relationship with another woman, not marriage. Jane's abandonment, Farida's abandonment. Jane as a teacher, Farida as a teacher. So you see exactly the same context. And uh, a charity school in Morton, a charity school in Zainis. Jane is moving from one place to another, Farida is moving from one place to another. So at the beginning of the slide we said that in the four section, in four uh, perspectives, a uh, writer describes Jane, so four uh, places, uh, and here Faraday is also moving from one place to another, so dynamic. So, uh, the meaning of the names, air means to travel in old French language, and ren, chalukushu, the name of a bird that cannot stand on one branch of the tree, so dynamic, so... Uh, even in the uh, language, even in the names, they have some similarities between these two novels. I would say it's the best, best comparative, uh, mm, how to say, uh, comparative uh, novels for me. Uh, if you want to write an article, it would be really interesting for you, interesting topic for you. And by the way, if this um, slide uh, is... Um, my slide when I prepared it uh, when I was in Italy is for my um, examination. So exam uh, for exam preparation I made it, and um, of course it was so bored, um, so wide, broad and wide. But now I uh, was obliged to shorten it because uh, if we talk um, deeply about Jane Eyre, um, we need a lot of time to talk about it. That's why I just shortened some slides. And that's the end of our um, video lesson. I would like you to uh, read Jane Eyre from the original, not uh, adaptation books or not translations, because you need to read from the original text and you need to analyze from the original um, narrations. That's why I will send you a PDF version of Jane Eyre and um, try to uh, think about my questions during our video lesson. And I hope that you uh, made some notes when I was talking about themes, symbols and um, comparisons and so on. So uh, thanks a lot for watching. Uh, see you next time. Bye.